presentation I want to discuss is also just some feedback, uh, which is from a regional level, uh, from the African Wildlife Economy Summit, uh, which sort of frames the discussion further around the, the topic of this presentation. I'm also going to give some case studies, uh, bring it down to a really grassroots level around the work that we've been involved in, and that's particularly looking at the wildlife economy space and particularly uh, looking at uh, the community involvement in that. So I'm going to give some practical uh, examples of some of the challenges that uh, we've encountered in, that, in the process, particularly in the last year, on a range of different sites that uh, we've been in, engaging on. And then also just to share some of the opportunities that exist as well. So South Africa sort of has uh, jumped the gun quite uh, proudly in terms of developing a national biodiversity economy strategy. And along with that is a wildlife economy strategy. So it's based on the premise of developing an inclusive rural econo economy, innovating and accelerating with the people for the people, which is, which is really good. And it's looking to do this. It's got some really ambitious targets, as um, a lot of us know. And it's, some of them seem unrealistic. And what are the opportunities that exist in the landscape to, to try and uh, achieve these, these ambitious targets? So in terms of the, the Wildlife Economy Summit uh, that was held in the African Wildlife Economy Summit. It was held in Victoria Falls in June. Um, some of you m might have attended or seen the outcomes of it. Uh, it was a very high-level summit with, uh, with a lot of presidents uh, meeting. Essentially, it looked at trying to draw the African continent together. Uh, it looked at the key aspects that Africa is seen as a future global e economic growth engine. But how are we going to do this um, when the chances are, if we carry on using the same economic models that other continents have used, we're going to run into challenges around environmental degradation. So it was really looking to center the growth opportunities around Africa's wildlife and wild areas um, around the, uh, the environment, but ensuring that anything that we do doesn't threaten the opportunities uh, that we have with the unique environment and wildlife areas that we have. And how do we translate that to ensure that we retain the biodiversity but at the same time start benefiting the people who live there? Talk a bit further about that and the how part of the summit. Um, they looked at coming out with ensuring that we relate livelihoods to wildlife and biodiversity appreciation, that people are empowered uh, to be meaningful and effective partners in the growing and measurable economic opportunities, and also looking to make wildlife a legitimate and effective land use option that can compete with other economic options on that land. And then it's about ensuring that the governments get the support um, by gaining uh, conservation enabling investment to achieve this. So to attract this investment, the right operating environment needs to be in place as well. Uh, and this is where it was concluded that experts will work with governments on how to deliver this. And I think what came out very strongly, which has come out in a few of the talks here, uh, I know Janetta is talking about CITES as well, the Southern African region coming out with, trying to come out with something that's very different to the model that's been applied. And the, the sort of wording that was used was a, a, new, mo a new deal uh, needs to be made for, for our environment and the wildlife economy. This was, as I said, a high-level um, sort of summit where a lot of the African presidents, Southern African presidents were there. There was some West African representation as well. But it was, again, much like CITES, uh, a lot of the countries that are interested in developing wildlife economies based on sustainable utilization. So what is this new vision? So basically, the aim is to look at uh, a pan-African context, unite the political and community leaders, private sector know-how and financial resources for a new vision of conservation that will deliver sustainable benefits. To set a new path to improve the prospects for both people and wildlife. And as the heading of my talk, uh, Bri Professor Brian Child said, we need to go and create, look at how do we make natural systems more profitable than modified ones. Added to this was also um, 
the new minister uh, for Department of Environment and Forestry and Fisheries was there as well, uh, Minister Creasy. She's chairing the, the grouping of African Environment Ministers and she said it is vital for, South Af for African nations that are the custodians of the world's largest megafauna populations to derive benefit from that wildlife. So what's interesting, I think the, this was a very high level uh, gathering. It set a good framework for, for, the, for the continent um, and it basically um, talks directly to the strategy that South Africa has developed, which, which is really good. And South Africa is hoping to hold the next Wildlife Economy Summit, which I think will probably come out with more of the detail um, that we're looking for. Looking at, a, at the next framework within South Africa, I think it was very important to, to understand the current context in South Africa. We all understand the economic situation. Um, but Minister Tito Mbueni's recent growth plan for South Africa argues that investment in tourism and agriculture has the biggest chance of success in creating sustainable jobs. Um, so this is, this is also pointing to the, the, the wildlife economy as a real opportunity that we should be looking to invest more in and, and as a country and as a sector we should be paying more attention to it. So the, the biodiversity economy um, has, has done quite a, 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 it's done a little bit of work around developing some tools uh, to assist us in the landscape. One of them which hasn't been actually rolled out formally is the Biodiversity Economy Investment Ready Guide which uh, I presented last year. I've applied this tool in the landscape and it's actually been very useful working with communities uh, to, to take them through this process as a, as a way of becoming investor ready. How do we want to set up a wildlife economy um, opportunity for communities? And this is a step-by-step -step process that allows them to see that and educates them at the same time. So the biodiversity economy nodes that um, have, have been identified out of the wildlife economy strategy essentially uh, focuses they, they strategic focus areas um, to focus our attention on gathering resources um, into, well, to address the complex challenges in, in growing rural economies. So, in terms of what's been achieved uh, over the last two decades, um, we haven't achieved, I don't think we've achieved as much as we wanted to, and now we've got, as I said, the, the frameworks to work with and, to, and the strategy to give us direction to achieving more within the wildlife economy space. And I think there's a, there really is a, a great opportunity to, to grow the sector and certainly look at the transformation element, um, which I think is, is critical to uh, getting more land in terms in, under conservation, um, but also addressing some of the serious challenges within the country. Okay, so to be able to understand that better, I think it's important to understand what are some of the barriers to developing this wildlife economy, and particularly looking at a local level, what are some of the challenges that we've run into um, in doing this, and, and possibly creates opportunities for uh, other organizations to participate in unlocking some of these, these issues that, uh, so that we can implement the, the, the wildlife economy, particularly in these nodes. So the first one I want to look at is, is an example that uh, around land ownership. The issue of land is obviously very topical and contentious in this country, um, but I think it's a lot more complicated when you get down to, to ground level and uh, you see that there's a lot of fragmented land ownership, uh, under, particularly under community ownership. Um, there's a lot of competing rights as well, which I don't think people fully understand. It's something that we've come across where you've got communities who have been successful land claimants and then suddenly you've got uh, the entities such as the Ngonyama Trust and communities living right next door and one community owns land and the other one doesn't have the full ownership rights that the other one does and a lot of tension develops there. So we've, we, we think that that really hasn't been addressed properly in the land discussion. I think it's also understanding land ownership responsibilities, and I think there's a, a big role here for Department of Agri and Rural Development, is really a sort of education process about legal uh, obligations of landowners. Um, now that they are title deed, uh, they have title deeds in hand. And also there is uh, 
a real in inability of communal landowners to enforce and manage land, um, which which seems like there's, you've got a hierarchical system in terms of having a trust, but it doesn't really work out that way. The second is uh, related to a project that we're working on where a reserve, a single reserve, functioning reserve, with three members of the Big Five were given to two separate communities. Um, that's created a challenge in terms of one community might have different objectives on changing the land use. Uh, and so, at the same time, you've got huge responsibility of who's going to manage herds of elephants on a reserve where you've got two separate communities that don't have resources to do that. Uh, and then where does that fall, that level of responsibility? So it's some of these things um, I think are, are real challenges, but at the same time, it's a real opportunity to engage with the landowners to start the discussion around developing their own wildlife economy. The third example is... Um, is the issue around actually getting title. Uh, so some people have, have access to land, and, but they don't actually, they haven't, the government hasn't handed over title deeds. And, I, and that was also, we found, a very big stumbling block because it, it, it uh, creates uncertainty in that land. We've also seen double land claims, where one community claims land and another one puts in a counterclaim. And how does that get resolved? And the problem is it creates inertia in the landscape where that land just sits there doing nothing because no one knows whose land it is. And so it's, it re really deprives the community of uh, opportunities in, on that land. Uh, government has also purchased land and it's not being utilized. So they purchase land, but there's no plan for that land and it could easily be put into developing wildlife economies. The other one is government has purchased land and given to individuals. Um, and individuals have have right to that land as opposed to as, as opposed to communities and there's also a slow resolution um, around the approved land claims so the land claims have been approved but the processing of it is very slow and that also uh, slows down opportunities uh, that communities can embrace um, at the same time there's been a lot of challenges around uh, the the education and support that these areas require. So I said we've got a nice tool with the investor guideline, um, but I think there's also a, a real need for the development of a tool to guide communities in, in engaging with public-private partnerships. A government is sitting in the middle and, and is, is wanting to engage with private sector to ensure that the right deal is made for communities but it's a public-private partnership, and sometimes government isn't there to, to manage that process. So we've seen some very bad agreements made with communities that are not empowering to them, um, and we need to find, develop a guideline that actually addresses that and assists communities to identify what is a good deal and what is not, particularly when it's working with the wildlife economy. Um, other ones which are, are standard is around funding. Um, Funding which is promised to communities and it doesn't end up there. Uh, broken promises are, 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 are real challenges for anyone who wants to work with communities, as, as I'm sure many of you have found, uh, that it becomes harder and harder to engage with the community when they've had their fingers burnt. Mentoring is needed, particularly in the wildlife economy space. You've got a lot of communities that do not understand the benefits that the wildlife economies can generate, but at the same time we need to temper that expectation because it's, it's a long-term investment, it's not a quick get rich opportunity. So with that we need to have uh, skills to develop the, the business model and develop proper um, plans for these uh, wildlife economies for communities. At the same time there's an investor component to this and we need to look at how do we secure those kind of investments, whether it's government and or private partnerships that invest in landscapes with communities, we need to find mechanisms and biodiversity stewardship is a really good way of securing that investment for all parties involved as well as um, certification schemes that are being developed. Um, so I think also the I want to just talk to one last point that we found, 
is that, and it's just a point of interest really, that uh, this is, a lot of talk was made of this investment. There's an investment con conference going on at the moment, um, but Toyota to, in to invest 454 million in highest prospect and, um, plant in Durban, which is fantastic for the economy. What, what, what I fail to, to understand is why aren't, isn't the wildlife economy getting the same attention? We've got two projects in one of the, the economy nodes that to, together are going to be putting in 700 million rand into a rural economy over the next 10 years and creating 700 jobs, but it doesn't get the attention of, of, of people. And I don't know why, but we need to work harder at the marketing aspect of this because it really is a success story and we need to promote further investment to show that it is a real opportunity to a broader audience. So some of the, the good news is that there, there is a, a fair amount of land just in the work that we're doing um, that we are seeing out there uh, for communities particularly to engage in the wildlife economy space and uh, that we can develop. This is just in KZN, a few examples. Uh, if we can get these developed, it's going to really uh, contribute to the, the national targets in terms of the strategy, the wildlife economy strategy as well. So it's, it's a really exciting space to be in, um, but there are these challenges that we are finding on the ground and we need to, we need to find ways to, to unlock them. So in conclusion, it's, we've got a nice, uh, we've got continental regional wildlife economy uh, commitment, which is fantastic. The National Biodiversity Economy Strategy has been identified as a growth sector to boost investment and development in the national growth plan. Uh, we've got wildlife economy nodes, there's suitable land for these opportunities, so it's really quite a low-hanging fruit. Um, and the scene is set for us to focus investment into the wildlife economy and really drive this hard uh, where we are going to get economic, the socio-economic benefits as well as uh, real conservation outcomes um, with the security of them being well managed. Thank you. <laughs>